much for coming all the way to the last lecture. Um, so today I, I want to talk about um, um, the following question. So you, you remember we have the support of the equilibrium measure and we have determined the, um, the limit of the empirical measures by this large deviation principle to be essentially uh, the equilibrium measure. So you're going to have endpoints quite densely packed in uh, some bounded set. And so what we want to do now is zoom. So let's say I, I take an origin here, x. And I want to zoom my configuration by multiplying everything by n to the 1 over d, which is the, you know, it's the scale I expect uh, I need to zoom by. And so after zooming, I will get a configuration of points um, which are well separated now. What is their uh, density? Well, if I zoom near mu, uh, near x, the density, with meaning the average number of points per unit volume, of course, is mu v at x. I assume that mu v is a regular uh, measure, right? And so when n goes to infinity, I'm going to get uh, an infinite configuration of points in the whole space. And in fact, if we are looking at a situation with temperature, this configuration of points is random. And so that's, uh, that makes what's called a point process, uh, a random point process. So it turns out that if you're in dimension one, uh, the limiting uh, point processes obtained from the, the log gases are understood, they are characterized, uh, they are called the sine beta processes. Uh, so characterized by Valco and Virag. If beta happens to be two, then it's a determinantal point process and you can compute uh, everything by a kernel. Uh, but in dimension, larger than one, there's only one case where it's known, where the limiting point process is known is d equals two, beta equals two. Essentially, and v quadratic, let's say. Because then the limiting point process is what's called the Ginibre point process. So it's associated to the Ginibre ensemble. And it's also determinantal. There's an explicit kernel, you can compute sort of everything. Okay, but beyond those two cases, those two situations, the, the bare existence of the limiting process is not known. So nobody knows. Uh. Okay, so what I would like to do now is, uh, is describe, introduce an object that will describe these configurations, that will essentially compute their, uh, their energy. And instead of obtaining a, a large deviations principle on the empirical measure, we're going to work on what's called the empirical fields, uh, or what's called a, a next order large deviation principle. So let me first uh, define my, uh, my quantity. So remember how we were working with uh, a next order energy, f and mu, which was defined like this with truncations, minus uh, cd, sum of g of eta i. Right, and we had these equations characterizing the uh, electric potential generated by the configuration. So now let me zoom everything by n to the 1 over d as I, uh, as I announced. So when you zoom things, you will get a, a, a blown up potential. And it will solve an equation of this form, minus Laplacian h. Sorry, so there is, if I put eta, I should truncate here. Uh, minus Laplacian h equals cd. So the, the sum of Dirac is going to uh, transfer into a sum of Dirac's at the zoomed points. And uh, this thing is going to become mu v at x plus 1 over n to the 1 over d. So this is the equation you obtain for the blown up uh, potential. And so here I'm using primes to denote uh, 
blow up. Okay, so xi prime is just xi multiplied by n to the 1 over d, and hn prime is the proper rescaling of hn. Okay, so now if I take limits as n goes to infinity of such an equation, so I expect my, uh, my sum of Dirac masses to converge to a sum of fixed Dirac masses, but this time it's infinite, right? C is infinite, so this is as n goes to infinity. Okay? So I will, I will uh, identify, um, so C like configuration. Right? So a configuration is a sum of Dirac's. Uh, and I identify the configuration and the sum of Dirac. So this I call C, if you want. So C is either a collection of points or the sum of Dirac's at those points. And if you uh, take the limit of this formally, you will get that the, the limit, so let's say it would be H infinity, will satisfy something like that. So sum of Dirac's on the configuration minus well, the limit of uh, this guy will be just mu v at the blow-up point. Right? So this is the blow-up center. So this is a constant. Call this m. It's just uh, the memory of the density uh, at the point where you zoomed. Okay, so when, when we rescale everything, we find ourselves with a, an equation of this form a sum of Dirac's minus a constant. If you are in dimension one, you remember you have to multiply by the Dirac mass on the real line. But okay, I don't, I will omit this. So there is an analog in dimension one. And so we have a system which is an infinite configuration of points of uh, Dirac charges and a uniform negative uh, background charge minus M. Okay, physicists call, the, call a system like this a gelium. So it's a system which is sort of locally, globally neutral. And so now we can define the energy of the gelium inspired by uh, the definition or the computation that was made here. We define it as, okay, if I have a and h, like this, I will take the limit, or the limb soup, or whatever, as r goes to infinity of, so I will take cubes of size r, kr, normalized by the cube, and look at how much energy is in the cube. So I have to do a double limit. So I have to take the limit as eta goes to zero. the energy of the truncated version of H in the cube minus CD times M times G of eta. And this whole thing is the energy. And then I take W for the configuration C to be the infimum over all possible choices which are compatible with the configuration. So I will uh, slow down a little bit. Okay, so what I'm doing here is I'm, I'm just computing um, the energy of this guy. So formally, I want to take the, the L2 norm of the gradient in a cube of size r, I take a big cube. I look at how much energy um, of the potential there is in that cube. But if you remember, this thing needs to be com computed with a truncation, otherwise it's infinite. So the eta is there to truncate, and you subtract off the divergent part. The m here is, is there because this is the number of particles per unit volume. So this is the natural uh, thing to put when you want to subtract uh, g of eta. Here you have to subtract it per number of uh, particles. So, so, so this should be... a I write it this way, I should put m times the volume. This is the expected number of particles 
in the box. Okay, so this is the energy in the cube, and then I compute the energy per unit volume, and I let the size of the cube go to infinity. Question. Yeah. Is, is C random, or C, is, this is a function? For any configuration, for any it's a function of C. For now, I define a function of C. Okay, so I have this infinite configurations with a neutral background, and let me call it C and M. So I remember the background. And here I have to take this infimum because, you see, if I have a solution to this equation, I in fact have many solutions. I can add any harmonic function. It will also be a solution. Uh, but then I can, so I take all the possible potentials that are compatible. Compatible means you solve this thing. You take all the possible potentials and I take the infimum of these energies. So in fact, there is one that achieves the minimum. So you have to sort of subtract mod out by these harmonic functions that represent the far field, in fact. OK, so I define this thing. Does it mean anything? That's, that's a question, right? Um, the claim is that this is a way of computing, if you want. If essentially, you would want to compute the sum of pairwise energies, or let's say g of x minus y, sum of Dirac minus m of x, sum of Dirac minus m of y, double integral in the complement of the diagonal, and in a cube of size r. This is roughly what you're trying to do. But it's not at all obvious that these two are the same. Um, and in fact, in general, they are not. There are some conditions under which they are. But this is, a, this is an object that actually sort of achieves this. It's, but it's replacing the computation of pairwise interactions in the cube by something based on this uh, potential energy, which is, it turns out to be more convenient to work with. OK, so can we compute this quantity? Um, well, there are cases where you can compute more explicitly. So there is ex an explicit, what I mean by explicit is a function of the point, right? something more explicit in terms of the point. There exists an explicit form if the configuration is periodic, for example. So if you take a periodic, if you take a box, you put any configuration there repeat it periodically, you can compute W in terms of the Green's function of the underlying torus. So if you have a periodic configuration, it means you have a torus. So you can write it like this. It will look like this. For G, which is now not the, not the, the Coulomb kernel, but the sort of periodized Coulomb kernel, the Coulomb kernel of the torus. Okay, so there's something explicit. And now we get to this question. So why do we get to the question? Because in the end, I'm going to prove that this W is actually the correct limit. So it, it will actually be the correct limit of the uh, next order energy. And so if you're interested in minimizers, for example, you will want to minimize this W. And so we have the question, what is the minimum? What is mean of W? And which configurations uh, achieve it? And we have only very few answers. So in 1D, the minimum is achieved. You could guess this. Right? At the configuration, which is the proper rescaling of the lattice Z. So you put the points completely regularly. Okay? So you have a logarithmic interaction of points with a neutral background. They choose to place themselves periodically in order to minimize their interaction. OK, beyond that, we don't have other results. The only partial result is in 2D. Partial result is in 2D. And in 2D, we only know what is the minimizer among lattices? So 
So if you take a configuration which is already on a perfect lattice, so not only you assume periodicity, but you assume that it's exactly a lattice. Then there is a theorem that says the minimum, so it's called the Brave lattice, if you will, of W over lattices of fixed volume, so let's say volume one, is uniquely achieved at the triangular lattice. Uh, so if you have a configuration which is already a lattice, the volume is fixed. You have only two parameters that you can vary. You can vary the, you know, the size of one of them and the angle. You can look at rectangular things like this, for example. All right, so this, how does it go? First, you use the explicit form in terms of uh, Green's functions of a torus. Uh, this Green's function, it, in turn, you can express it with uh, modular functions, modular forms. And then you look in the literature, and there's theorems from the 50s in number theory that say that the triangular lattice is the best. OK, so this means that this function w, at least it's good for something. It can distinguish between two different microscopic configurations, such as two lattices. And it tells you that the best is the triangular. Triangular means you make equilateral triangles, right? And remember, this is the lattice that is observed in uh, superconductivity. Vortices in superconductors for th form these triangular lattices, which are called Abrikozov lattices in physics. So Abrikozov got the Nobel Prize for predicting this. Uh, and so it's, uh, it's kind of consistent with, uh, uh, with what we obtained, because uh, we can prove that the energy from superconductivity if you take minimizers, you have to converge to minimizers of this function. Uh, and then you're left wondering, of course, is this really the minimum over all possible configurations? And this is an open question, maybe a conjecture. Right. In 2D, the minimum is achieved at the triangular lattice. What about higher dimensions? The situation is even worse in higher dimensions because in dimension three, say, um, the minimizer among lattices is not even known. There's a conjecture that it's the BCC lattice, the body-centered uh, cubic lattice. But the corresponding number from uh, res uh, result from number theory is, uh, is an open question. So let alone, of course, knowing which one is the minimizer among all configurations. There are some exotic things that happen in the dimensions 8 and 24. There are some uh, special lattices. And in dimensions 8 and 24, they can prove that those lattices are the best among lattices. Um, OK, there's other things that happen in dimensions 8 and 24. But in large dimensions, you should not expect a lattice. It's a little bit surprising, but in large dimensions, the lattices somehow are too sparse, right? There's too much space, and there's better ways of putting configurations. Of course, all of this is completely uh, not proven, but... Mm. Okay, so the way I defined it, it's not unique, because you can always perturb your configuration in a compact set, and it will not uh, be felt. If you make a, a compact perturbation, because I take limits of a lar large box. But OK, if you mod out, or if you make, a, if you assume uh, that you, if you look at the, the function on point processes, and you assume they are stationary, then you should expect uh, minimal uh, uniqueness. OK, so in 1D, it's proven. But, but 1D is the only case where we know the minimizer. So in 1D, if you look at the minimizer among stationary processes, it's uniquely achieved at the suitable uh, uh, stationarization of the lattice. 
Okay, so this is a result that was pr proven by Thomas Leblay. Uh, by the way, in 1D, you don't have to be logarithmic. The interaction doesn't have to be logarithmic. This thing is true for all, uh, all interactions of the form 1 over x minus y to the power s. You can prove uh, that, that the lattice is the best. So it's not at all specific to the log. And in dimension 2, also this triangular lattice, <laughs> since I'm talking, uh, I think it's fun, this topic, but um, the, the triangular lattice is expected to be the optimal for wide class of interactions. It's not specific to Coulomb either. Uh, there's some conjecture by Cohn and Kumar that the, the triangular lattice is universally optimizing, so it's the optimizer for a certain class of interaction energies. Um, if physicists seem to be interested in it. I mean, I went to physics conferences where they were talking about it. But I think the main uh, motivation is for approximation theory, because they, when they have um, signals, they are in large dimensions, and they like to pack the, the space by spheres, and so people are interested. OK. All right, so there's one more thing I want to say. Uh, it's that there is a scaling relation and uh, maybe I'll take my notes in order not to make a mistake. Um, you remember how there is this parameter m that corresponds to the density. Uh, so it's very easy to rescale things, right? If you have a configuration with density m, you can zoom it, blow it up, or blow it down to make it density 1. It's not going to be very difficult, and so we have a a scaling relation, which is this. It will be a bit useful later. So there's the properly rescaled configuration with background 1, minus 2 pi d over 2 pi over d, m log m. That's in the logarithmic cases. And if you're in the Coulomb case in dimension uh, larger than 3, there's some factors that's multiplicative this time. So that's the rescaled configuration. OK, so dimension 2, uh, logarithmic uh, 1 and 2, and Coulomb dimension 3 behave differently with rescaling, and that's actually uh, something interesting. All right. So now we have a definition for a fixed configuration. What are we going to do for uh, our random configurations? We're going to form, uh, so we're going to define P, so let's say Px. So remember, I have a, I have a blow-up center. I call it x. So px is going to be uh, the, the point process that I see when I center at x. So let's call it pxn. If I have a configuration x1, xn, it's going to be the uh, Dirac, so call this xn, right, with a vector. And the zoomed guy is going to be xn prime. So it's n to the 1 over d times xn. So I'm going to take a Dirac, add the configuration xn prime, rescaled or, or sorry, shifted to be centered at x. So I want to shift by n to the 1 over d x. OK, so x lives in the original uh, set sigma. I zoom everything. It becomes n to the 1 over d x. I recenter everything near that guy. I form the Dirac mass at this. It gives me a, a point process. So this is the point process centered at x. And then I'm going to form Pn, which is roughly, or so say Pn bar, which is essentially, uh, formally, it's the, average, it's the integral of this Pn x dx. So I integrate over sigma. I normalize by the volume in order to make it a probability. And this is now a probability on, so maybe I will tell you how it acts on test functions. So I glue together all the px. Right? And this becomes what we call a tagged point process, because the, there is a tag, which is x, which is just the memory of where you centered. So if I integrate a certain test function, of point and configuration against dpnx. 
or against dpn, sorry. Then it's the same as integrating over x. f of x, c, dpn x of c. Right. So this guy is a probability on configuration. OK, so this Pn bar, this is what we call the empirical field. So it's the guy that encodes all the blow-ups of your configurations with all the recentering. And so now we can define an energy W for these empirical fields as follows. So W bar of P bar is going to be simply the average of W of the configuration with background mu V of X integrated against dpx of c. OK, and then you average. So for each given x, you compute w, the energy of the configuration, with the background that corresponds to that point, And then you integrate. So essentially, you're, you're just going around the, the domain here and averaging all the energies of the point configurations that you see uh, when, you, when, you, when you zoom around that point. So let's say, imagine that you have a situation where when you zoom, half of the time you see a triangular lattice, and half of the time you see a square lattice. Then this thing will be an average of a half of the energy of the triangular and a half of the energy of the square. Right? It's the average. And I claim that this quantity is the right, uh, is the right limiting quantity. So let me um, write it. So these Pn bars, they're going to have a limit, typically up to, so you can prove that there is a tightness uh, property. So up to extraction of a subsequence, the Pn bar associated to a configuration will converge to a P bar. And so far, uh, there's no probability. The, the configurations are given. I don't know yet by which process. And so I can define the W bar of the P bar. The bars stand for average. OK, so the, the claim is this, is that the next order energy that we were looking at for the point configuration is bounded below. So if you normalize it by n, you get a lower bound from below by the energy of the limiting um, empirical field. OK, so if, so there is a proposition. OK, so I should mention that this, um, this energy W uh, was first introduced by uh, in a work with Etienne Sandier. And then it was improved in works with Nicolas Rougerie. And essentially, we already had this, this type of lower bound in there. OK, so the, the idea is that this W bar of P bar is a good candidate to be the limiting object to the energy. This is the energy after you subtract off these uh, fixed uh, dominant terms. And the idea is this is optimal. Right? This, is a, this is an inequality. It's essentially optimal. In what sense is it optimal? Well, it's optimal in the sense that if I give myself a p-bar, I can reconstruct a configuration for which the inequality goes in the other direction. So there exists good configurations for which this is matched. Of course, there's many configurations for which there, there is not equality. It suffices to take a configuration and let two points get very close to each other. Then the energy has to go to infinity, but this one doesn't have to go to infinity. So it's only for good configurations that there is equality. Yes. Yes. So once over sigma, once against p. Yes. 
Thanks. Yes, essentially, yes. So th this, uh, this proof, is, it's not very hard. You have, to, uh, you have to look at the energy and observe that it can be rewritten as an average against these PNs. And essentially, the quantities are lower, semi-continuous. And you see, this is where it's, it's very useful that W bar was defined the way it was, because th it was exactly modeling the, the definition that's in Fn. It was, it was following that exactly. So then it's lower semi-continuity. It's just about finding the right objects to talk about. But proof is not very difficult. OK, so now we have this limiting guy. And as I said, it's optimal. Uh, and so for, if you're interested in minimizers of the, ener the original energy, th this is the end of the story. Because if you're looking at minimizers, you first you use the splitting formula. It, uh, it takes out the leading order terms, you know, n squared iv of mu v, possibly the n log n terms. And then you're left with this term. And now this thing is telling you I'm going to have to minimize w bar. And because I know how to build configurations for which there is equality, I can build configurations which achieve this. And this gives me an expansion of the minimum. Okay? And you have an expansion, and you know now that if you take minimizers, their empirical fields have to converge to minimizers of this W bar. And because this is an average of Ws, it means that roughly, if you zoom for almost all the blow-up centers, you should see a minimizer with respect to its suitable background. Right? So yeah, the equilibrium measure dictates the background. It dictates the density of points. If you zoom, you should see most of the time a minimizer of W with that density. So now we are, if we believe in the conjecture, for example, in 2D, this tells us that we expect to see almost all the time something that looks like a triangular lattice or something that has the energy of the triangular lattice. Of course, you can have many defects. This thing will not see them. It's too rough to see defects in a lattice. But in 1D, it means that you expect to see configurations that are always uh, periods. So you expect these limiting point processes to be concentrated on, um, on, on, on lattices or on optimizers. All right, so now we want to look at the situation with temperature. So what do we have with temperature? Remember, we formed the Gibbs measure. Gibbs 